it's, um, it's really exciting to be here uh, because it is, as it says, a forgotten platform for reform. Is this on? It's on. Yeah. Yes, yeah. good. Um, and uh, uh, and it, it amazed me. I thought that I was uh, pretty knowledgeable about this, this period of Australian history and Indigenous history and that. Uh, but there was a lot of things during this research that uh, I, um, I was very um, uh, amazing to find out about, about people. But I also got to pay respect to uh, and thank uh, two of the researchers who worked on this with me. Uh, uh, Dr Vicky Greaves-Williams is an Indigenous historian, uh, PhD in history. Uh, and we got uh, Miles Gerard, who's uh, an Indigenous undergraduate law student at Sydney University, and they did. A, uh, they did. Well, to be honest, they did most of the work. I just sat there and made it into my own story, and get all the platitudes and awards. Um, so I'd like to thank them and also Pamela. Now, how this come about was very simple. It was, uh, you know, for, for many years, as people know, I was in the president of the Australian Labor Party and the. And, and, and we always asked the questions, and, and then after I, I left the Labor Party, people used to ask me this question, you know. Uh, we were challenged by people, what has the coalition done for Indigenous Australians? Now, I, I knew a bit, uh, because uh, as you can see by my blonde hair, I was born in that period of the in Menzies government in 1956. And, uh, and so we knew about, uh, you know, the Catholic uh, funding of Catholic schools during the 60s after the Goulburn strike. We knew about uh, Menzies in regard to uh, uh, voting rights for Aboriginal people and then the forcing of voting rights then uh, onto uh, state and territory governments to get that uh, nationalised. Because under our constitutions, where are federations and the states and, and territories, as we found out during COVID, have more power than the state, than the federal government. Uh, so... So they kept them challenged me about that. And one thing that really hit me was the lack of knowledge and history of young coalition members. They didn't know about their history going back that far. But not only that, it was coalition members, but the wider general public uh, that didn't know about this history. And these were the key architects of, for that change uh, through that thing. And of course, it's the Menzies era. So it's Sir Robert Menzies, who was Prime Minister from 1939 to 41, and then 49 to 66. Uh, we had uh, Harold Holt, who carried on that reform agenda. And then we had, uh, of course, we had Sir Paul Hasluck, who was in the area. He was, had a number of ministries, but the most important one for this uh, talk tonight was Minister for Territories from 1951 to 1963. And why is that important? Because under our constitution up until 1967, the federal government didn't have any powers in regard to Aboriginal people. It, that was controlled, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that was controlled by the states and territories. And that's why you had this interesting thing in regard to voting rights. So in New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria, Tasmania, uh, Aboriginals had voting rights. But in... Uh, in Queensland and uh, Western Australia, they didn't have voting rights. And so, and that's because we were a federation and under the constitution it said you only could vote in federal elections if you had voting rights in your state. Uh, and so Menzies forced that issue in 1962. But I'll just go on to it. And then of course, the important thing about the territories, Minister for the Territories, is they had they were the ones who were in charge of the Northern Territory with a large Aboriginal population. And they were in, in you know, uh, Norfolk Island and, and ACT. And, and Paul Hasluck was an interesting, very interesting bloke. Look, I'm very honoured to be here, to be invited to, to speak here tonight. And I'm especially pleased to be able to uh, begin to address some of the wrongs that have occurred in assessing the role of Sir Robert Menzies and his government in the in governments in the complexity of Australian uh, Indigenous affairs over the course of his prime ministership. In preparing for tonight's lecture in a uh, in a, a forgotten platform for reform, uh, Indigenous policy during the Menzies era, 
was I'd like to thank, as I said before, Dr. Greaves Williams and Jared uh, Miles Jared. Uh, I believe uh, I had a, a good basic knowledge of Indigenous policy during the Menzies era. What I did discover was the background and drive, which I'll be talking about before I get into all the all the reforms they did. Uh, that, him, that Sir Robert Menzies himself and his minister in, in this endeavour, Sir Paul Hasluck, had. Menzies and um, Hasluck had been a partnership which not only changed Indigenous peoples' lives for the better, but put the nation and Indigenous people on a journey that we're still seeing and feeling today. And, of course, the referendum later this year is, is one of those. As we know, uh, Sir, Sir Robert Menzies was Prime Minister of Australia 39 to 41, and then again from 49 to uh, 66, uh, the longest serving Prime Minister in the history of Australia. And Sir Paul Hasluck was his minister from territories 51 to 63. It is my contention that Menzies and Hasluck contributed a great deal to the advancement of Indigenous people in the Menzies era and beyond through incremental changes, righting the wrongs through Menzies government's policy development generally and also through the kind of men they were. This period of Australian politics was totally dominated as it was by Sir Robert Menzies, established a platform for reform in Indigenous lives. The English novelist L.P. Hartley famously said, the past is a foreign country and they did things differently there. And that's important to remember because a lot of people get confused when they look back in the history and they sort of judge people by the rules that we have today and the views we have today. And there's a few things I'll point out which people don't understand. But, you know, for us, we, we cannot hope to ever truly know the past, what happened at every minute and every hour of the day and what happened in every meeting that a Prime Minister may have had. But we can uh, interpret archives, we can read between the lines, and we can talk to people who come from those eras if, if they're still alive. What is important is to criti critically analyse the past for a thorough knowledge of the context of the times. So Robert Menzies was a man for his times. As a man for his times, he he read the room so well that when he visited Britain during the World War II, there was a powerful and influential people who wanted him to be prime minister instead of Sir Winston Churchill. And we're glad that didn't happen because we had a great prime minister here, as well as we had a great prime minister leading the war against the Nazis. When we seek to understand context in which Sir Robert Menzies' life was lived, it is important to remember that he is a child of the 19th century. He was born in, 19, in 1894, in the midst of the 1890s Great Depression. His father had been a locomotive painter in Ballarat, but then went on to try his luck as a storekeeper and Jeep Parrot. Is it that right? Jeep Parrot. Jeep Parrot, yes. <laughs> I had to teach you Bundjalung and he had to teach me this one, yeah. A small country town of not more than 55 people in the Winmara, rural Victoria. His parents were Australian born. He was the first Prime Minister of Australian birth parents. He knew about politics and the importance of service from an early age. He was not a privileged, he, he was not a privileged childhood, but he did have two uncles who were elected to members of the Victorian Legislative Assembly and the Australian House of Representatives, respectively. His maternal grandfather, John Sampson, was active in the trade union movement. Mm, that, that, that was a little, little interesting thing I found out. <laughs> uh, the, the inaugural president of the Creswick Miners Association that he co-founded with the future president of the flag ring Australian Labor Party, uh, William Spence. So Robert experienced Australia at war during the First World War from during his formative years, with two older brothers serving in overseas campaigns, 
being the younger brother, he stayed, he stayed to care for his ailing father and joined the local, com I love this line, joined the local compulsory militia as if he was a volunteer. As a, as, as a student, Sir Robert was a supporter of compulsory overseas conscription that went to a referendum in 1916. He would have been conscripted if, if it was successful. This is a clear indication of his patriotism. The referendum, was un, the referendum was unsuccessful and then also held in 1917 when it was again unsuccessful. And of course it was a referendum that split the Labor Party in those days. The issue of compulsory conscription of young Australian men for overseas service uh, during World War I was extremely divisive and split Australian society in much the same way as the voices today. As Mark Twain said, history does not repeat itself, but it does often rhyme. The next important factor in the context of Sir Robert's life and times is that he was Prime Minister when Australia again went to war in World War II. He was opposed to war but was a man of duty and had to do his best to see Australia was protected. There is something galvanising about the primacy of war that as politicians focused on international relations and this was particularly the case for Australia. Australia was a small European outpost in a, in a majority Asian world with a population of only 7 million people. The UK had 41 million, Germany had 86 million, the United States of America at the time had 148.5 million, and Japan, 72 million. The truth is we had to rely on a larger power like Great Britain or the United States to assist us in any wartime adventures. We didn't find many... You don't find many internal reforms during wartime. In fact, every population is asked to sacrifice for the war effort. And for Australia, this was so much more immediate and urgent. We can understand something about his beliefs in that he was opposed to anti-Semitism, the persecution of Jewish people in Europe in the 1930s. He sent a letter of support to demonstrators in Melbourne in 1933 against those atrocities against the Jews. In fact, there's no evidence of him subscribing to race, racist notions of human inequality. Menzies became Prime Minister in April 1939 when Lyons suddenly passed away and on the 3rd of September was broadcasting to the people of Australia by radio Australia's declaration of war against Germany. The Commonwealth went to war in the support of Britain when Britain declared war after the invasion of of Poland in, on the 1st of September 1939. Sir Robert was 44 years old, so he's a few years older than me. He sent Australian troops to the Middle East and to Singapore on the request of the British government. Then on December the 7th 1941, Japan attacked the United States base at Pearl Harbor. Australia is, was at war with Japan now uh, Menzies in opposition, but as an Australian caught up in all of the, the, all, all of the parts of war. In 1948, the Labor government under Chifley proposed a, a referendum to extend the war powers of Australian government to control the prices of food and rents and etc. Menzies opposed that and won the no case. I hope that's an omen for me. Menzies, the leader of the Liberal Party, re-elected as Prime Minister in 1949, proposed legislation to outlaw, and people don't understand the context of this, of the Communist Party that was defeated in 1950. However, in the same year, Menzies, and this is the context of it, and the, com and the Parliament committed Australian troops to fight against the Communist North Koreans who had invaded South Korea until the wars ended in 1953. The Menzies government could not ignore the other war on our doorsteps too, the second of the Indo-Chinese war that in, that in Vietnam began as a French colonial war following World War II but was supported by the United States in 1954 as an anti-communist war. Australia committed troops to this war in the year of Sir Robert's retirement. The whole 18 years, 5 months and 12 days of Sir Robert Menzies' Prime Ministership of Australia 
was marked by wars, including the war with Japan that saw Australia on the brink of invasion, worldwide depressions, part uh, post-war reconstruction, and then the United Nations formed in 1945, and the ANZUS Treaty was signed in 1950, while the Cold War and concerns about communist insur insurrection to our north persisted. And through all of this, there is no doubt that the social, economic and political position of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people in Australia improved. It is my contention that Menzies' large, large popular base of support that he built by radio for a weekly radio broadcast, broadcast to those who turned, he turned the forgotten people. The, non, the ordinary, non-elite citizens of Australia also included Aboriginal families in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. The forgotten people were those not represented by trade unions, not rich and, orf and often struggling. They had sons, brothers and fathers who had gone to war and many did not return. Mansi said, and I paraphrase here, the real lo life of this nation is to be found in the homes of people who are nameless and unadvertised. The home is the foundation of sanity and sobriety. Its health determines the health of society as a whole. In these talks, he outlined the, va the values critical to shaping Australia's wartime and post-war policies. There was no doubt in our minds that Aboriginal people were, were patriots, and saw themselves as part of the Australian community's war effort. They had served and they had lost family members. Many Aboriginal families like my own were aspirational. That is why I think many would be following those radio broadcasts with interest. In 1949, Parliament legislated to ensure that all Aboriginal ex-servicemen should have the franchise. In 1951, Paul Haslock was appointed by the Menzies government for territories, a portfolio that he remained in for the next 12 years. He was a man who had considerable experience with the, with, with the, the, the life of Aboriginal people. He was an original member of the Australian Aboriginals Amelioration Association in 1940, 1932 that aimed to protect Aboriginal people from cruelty and injustice and, assi and assist in their development. As a journalist, he, he worked for the West Australian. He accompanied the Mosley Royal Commission into Aboriginal people. Now this is the Royal Commission that was set up to look at the living standards and that in Aboriginal people in the 1930s. And then completed a master's degree based on research from interviews conducted throughout Western Australia and published as black Australians. Haslock wasted no time. The first native welfare conference of federal and state ministers were held that same year. He proposed a new policy of assimilation of Aboriginal people into the Australian population so that they can live like other Australians. Now, because of him using that word assimilation, people took that as a derogatory thing. But in actual fact, what he was talking about was that Aboriginal people could own their own homes, have jobs, their children get educated, uh, they, they can have their culture, uh, their beliefs and their language continuing on in that process. This was a plan to end segregation from the rest of society. In fact, it come back out of the Mosley report where he said uh, missions, reserves, and the segregation of Aboriginal people from the rest of Australian society was a failure, and that was in 1930s, in the mid-1930s. He said the only way forward was through this assimilation, so Aboriginals can have jobs, have houses, continue their culture and continue their languages. The government led by Sir Robert Menzies wanted to make this a thing of the past, this separate segregation, this leaving Aboriginal people on reserves and missions. People have got to remember that this was these reserves and missions, because the federal government couldn't make laws about it, were state controlled. I was born in 1956 under the, the Aboriginal Protection Act in New South Wales and the Aboriginal Welfare Board. 
and I lived the first 13 years of my life under, that, under those laws, those segregation laws. This is demonstrated in Sir Paul Hasluck's Menzies for Territory Speech to the Native Welfare, and this is the terms of the day, the Native Welfare Conference in 1961. During his opening address, Hasluck stated, while we acknowledge the tasks that governments must do, we should remind all the people of Australia of the claims of Aboriginal Australians. For in the long run, it is not the governments, but the people of Australia who can bring them the chance of a fuller and happier life and give them a helping hand. One of our purposes must be to find ways in which governments and people can work more closely together for the social reforms we are trying to shape. Today we have to deal with the situation that exists today. We are making decisions and plans not for the past 30 years, but for the next 30 years that are just starting. In his, in his speech, Hasluck emphasised the need for a cooperative and comprehensive approach to address, to address the challenges faced by Indigenous communities. He, he acknowledged the historical injustices and discrimination faced by Indigenous Australians and expressed the government's commitment to improving their living conditions and opportunities. Hasluck stressed the importance of providing better education and health care for Indigenous people to empowering them and enhancing their overall well-being. He also highlighted the significance of preserving Aboriginal uh, culture, traditions and languages, recognising the importance in their identity and well-being of the Indigenous communities. The conference aimed to create a platform from dialogue between government and Indigenous leaders to identify the pressing issues and design policies that could uplift the socio-economic status of Indigenous Australians. It marked an important step in the ongoing journey between recognising Indigenous rights and fostering better relationships between the government and Indigenous communities. Overall, this speech emphasised the Menzies government's commitment to addressing Indigenous welfare issues and striving for better outcomes for Indigenous Australians through a collaborative and respectful approach. Nevertheless, acknowledging the historical context and the policies of the time, it is important to recognise that Paul Haslock's approach with the backing of the Menzies government to Indigenous welfare included assimilationist policies may not align with modern standards and has faced criticism from potentially uh, notions of white supremacy. However, it is essential to understand the nuance of Hasluck's advocacy, which was not focused on promoting breeding out of colour, but rather aimed at eradicating colour as a socially and political significant factor reducing it to a superficial attribute. Hasluck advocated for a vision where colour consciousness would be irrelevant in modern Australian society, applying this principle equally to Aboriginals and non-Aboriginal citizens. His perspective sought to promote a sense of unity among all citizens, emphasising common Australian identity regardless of racial or ethnic backgrounds. Undoubtedly seen that Has Hasluck was uh, Menzies Minister for Territories and a close advisor to the Prime Minister on Aboriginal Welfares, this commitment was delivered by the Menzies administration through positive initiatives that had a beneficial impact on Indigenous communities. These initiatives, though limited in the scope, were considered groundbreaking for their time and marked early steps towards addressing Indigenous welfare and Indigenous rights. Firstly, the Men's Administration was instrumental in granting Indigenous people full citizenship and voting rights. Contrary to popular belief, the 1967 referendum did not afford citizenship rights or voting rights to Indigenous people. The 1967 referendum was significant as it sought to address other important constitutional and legal issues 
affecting Indigenous Australians, including removing discriminatory clauses from the Constitution. However, as early as the 1940s, more significantly 1948, there was passed the Commonwealth Nationality and Citizenship Act. A lot of people think that Australians had citizen, the title of, of Australian citizenship, but in fact, prior to that, we were British subjects. And it granted Australian citizenship to Indigenous Australians. This landmark, landmark legislation re, replaced the concept of British subject status with Australian citizens for all individuals, including Indigenous Australians. It granted full Australian citizen for Indigenous people, giving them equal legal status and recognition as citizens of the country. Prior to this act, Indigenous Australians were classified under various legal categories, but this legislation ensured the inclusion as citizens with equal rights and responsibilities at the federal level. And I'll make that a clear thing at the federal level because uh, because the rules and regulations that governed Aboriginals were still in the hands of the states and territories, hence why I still lived under the Aboriginal Protection Act. Until, uh, additionally, the 1962 Commonwealth Electoral Act extended rights to all Indigenous Australians ensuring their participation in the democratic process. The Menzies government continued to dis its commitment to Indigenous rights by passing the Commonwealth Electoral Act in 1962. This act amended the electoral laws to extend voting rights to all Indigenous Australians in federal elections. Prior to this change, many Indigenous Australians were excluded from voting based on discriminatory state laws and electoral practices. By enacting the legislation, the Menzies government ensured that all Indigenous Australians had the, the right to participate in democratic process and have their voices heard. What this did was force the West Australian government to give voting rights within the following months after that pa passage of, of, the, uh, uh, of the federal voting rights because it would have been bizarre for them to keep two books. The Aboriginals were on the federal election and then they weren't on the state elections. And then, as, as the deep north, Queensland, they hung out till 1965, but then they also capitulated and gave full voting rights to Aboriginal people at, that, at the local level. The citizenship and voting rights granted by these legislative changes were significant milestones in recognising the full citizenship and equal participation of Indigenous Australians in Australian society. These reforms represented important steps towards addressing historical injustices and removing discriminatory ba barriers, which were those electoral acts at the state level. That had previously limited Indigenous Australians' rights and opportunities. It is essential to recognise and acknowledge these historical developments that have contributed to the the progress of Indigenous rights in Australia, including the significant role played by the Menzies government in granting these citizen and voting rights to Indigenous Australians. These legislative changes paved the way for further advancements in Aboriginal uh, uh, rights and contribution to ongoing journeys towards reconciliation and equality for all Australians. For example, while Menzies was not directly involved in the 1960 rever uh, referendum, his previous policies and the social and political context during his tenure had an influence on the climate in which the referendum took place. His government's earlier policies, which were assimilations in nature, created a backdrop against which public opinion on Indigenous rights evolved, ultimately leading to the successful outcome of the 67 referendum. Further, further this is indica indication of Menzies' strategy affecting the most e efficient increment changes for Indigenous people by exploiting and changing the public debate and opinions. Secondly, the Council for Aboriginal Affairs was established in 1951, representing an early effort by the Australian Federal Government to address Indigenous issues systematically. It aimed to coordinate policies and improve the living conditions and opportunities for Indigenous communities across the country. 
Uh, this lecture discusses the significance and limitation of the Council as well as its impact on Indigenous welfare. In the post-World War II era, Australia wish, uh, witnessed a shift in attitudes towards Indigenous Australians. The Council for Aboriginal Affairs emerged in this context as a response to growing awareness of the plight of Indigenous communities. The C Council's primary objective was twofold. First, it sought to coordinate policies relating to Indigenous Australians across various government departments and agencies. This centralisation was critical in fostering collaboration and ensuring consistent policies. Additionally, the Council focused on improving the living conditions and welfare of Indigenous communities. Excuse me. Addressed issues such as housing, healthcare, education and employment opportunities. The Council recognised the urgent need to uplift Indigenous Australian socio-economic status, aiming to bridge the gap that has persisted for many years. <laughs> However, the Council faced significant limitations that impacted its effectiveness. One major criticism was the lack of Indigenous representatives amongst its members, the absence of Indigenous voices in decision-making processes undermined the Council's ability to understand and address the needs of Indigenous communities accurately. Furthermore, the Council had limited legislative power, hindering its ability to implement significant policy changes or override state-based discriminatory policies affecting Indigenous Australians. Its reliance on voluntary compliance from state governments and agencies undermined its capacity to drive substantial change in Indigenous affairs, no matter how hard they tried. Furthermore, the, the, the prevailing assimilation approach to Indigenous affairs during the 1950s and 60s overshadowed the Council's effect to address the specific needs and rights of Indigenous people. Uh, an assimilation policy is aimed to integrate Indigenous Australians in the mainstream society, of, often disregarding the preservation of their unique cultures and identities. This approach hindered the, uh, hindered the Council's ability to develop policies that promoted self-determination and cultural preservation for Indigenous communities. Despite its limitations, the Council of uh, Aboriginal Affairs marked an early recognition of the need for coordinated Indigenous policies. It laid the groundwork for future developments in Indigenous affairs in Australia. In the following years, the Council's establishment since uh, subsequent governments recognised the need for more comprehensive and empowering frameworks, frameworks to, address, to address Indigenous issues. Initiatives such as the National Aboriginal Conference in 1971 through to 1977, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission in 1989, representing significant steps towards self-determination and Indigenous empowerment. Even before the federal government was empowered by the 67 referendum, the Menzies administration still could make Indigenous policies in the Northern Territory. And it was here that Menzies Minister for Territories, Paul Hasluck, led a thorough reforming program. One way this was done was through the Menzies government's introduction of land trust in the Northern Territory during the 1960s. It represented a crucial step and an enormous foundation for recognising Indigenous land rights in Australia. Land trusts allowed Indigenous communities to claim and retain ownership of their traditional lands, granting them a a degree of control and autonomy over their territories. Before the introduction of land trusts, much of the land in the Northern Territory and other parts of Australia was classified as Crown land, effectively under the control of the, federal, of the Australian government. This, disregarded, uh, this system disregarded the long-standing connection of Indigenous communities to their ancestral lands, leading to dispossession and dislocation. The Menzies government acknowledged the importance of addressing this historical injustice and began implementing policies to restore land rights to Indigenous Australians. The establishment of land trusts played a central role in this effort. Land trusts involved designing specific areas as land, as Aboriginal reserves and Aboriginal land, formally recognising Indigenous ownership and custodian of their traditional, traditional lands, <coughs> 
The concept offered communal land ownership, allowing Indigenous communities to retain collective control over their lands, consistent with their communal land title systems. The objectives, the objectives of land trust was multifaceted. First, they provided formal recognition of Indigenous ownership, redressing historical dispossession from their ancestral territories. Second, land trust provided Indigenous culture heritage and spiritual connection to the land, allowing communities to continue their traditions. Moreover, land trust opened economic and social development opportunities. Indigenous communities gained control over the lands in April, the negotiation with mining companies, pastoralists and other stakeholders for land use agreements. This led to economic development, employment opportunities and infrastructure advancement in these areas. The land trusts were also aligned with the broader objectives of empower Indigenous communities and pro promoting self-determination. By granting control of their lands, the Menzies government aimed to foster greater autonomy and decision-making power for Indigenous communities regarding their traditional lands. While the introduction of land trusts was a significant advancement in Indigenous land rights, it did not address all historical land dispossession issues. Many Austra Indigenous Australians in other states and territories continue to struggle to regain ownership and control, and control of their lands. Additionally, lands trusts face challenges, in, including limited land areas allocated and disputes over land use with other stakeholders. Stakeholders. Never, nevertheless, the concept of land trust led the foundation for future development in Indigenous land rights in Australia. Subsequent, subsequent governments built upon this framework, leading to the establishment of comprehensive land rights legislation and recognition of native title rights in later decades. The Menzies government tenure also cultivated significant effects to address Indigenous welfare and education in Australia. The government's initiatives in providing funding for welfare and health services, including housing, health care and education, as well as its investment in education and, vo and vocational training programs for Indigenous Australians. The, Me the Menzies government acknowledged the socioeconomic disparities and health challenges faced faced by Indigenous communities and sought to provide funding for essential welfare and health service. A key focus was on housing, with the government investing in building houses and improving living conditions in Indigenous communities. This was important given the inadequate housing conditions that many Indigenous families lived in, uh, leading to overcrowding and, substantial li and substandard living conditions. Healthcare services are also a priority in the government's welfare initiative. The government launched programs to improve access to medical facility, facilities, health clinics and essential healthcare services in remote and regional Aboriginal areas. These effort, efforts aim to address the significant health disparity faced by Indigenous communities, including high rates of chronic disease and shorter life expectancies compared to non-Indigenous Australians. In the realm of education, the Menzies government recognised the importance of providing education opportunities to Indigenous Australians. Funding was directed towards establishing schools in Indigenous communities and improving educational access. The government to, uh, aimed to address the historical lack of in education opportunities for Indigenous children, which had, had perpetrated uh, socio-economic disparities and limited employment prospects. Recognise the importance of equipping Indigenous individuals with the skills needed for employment and integration in the broader society. The Menzies government invested in education and vocational training programs. Vocational training initiatives aim to provide practical skills that lead to employment opportunities. Through these programs, Indigenous Australians could gain training in various trades and professions, in enhancing their employability and potential for economic self-sufficiency. An example of this program is a government in, in dis, initiati, initiated employment programs for Indigenous Australians in the cattle industry in Northern Australia. These programs to offer employment opportunities and promote self-sufficiency amongst Indigenous uh, people. The government acknowledged that education was provable in breaking 
the cycle of poverty and disadvantage and sought to empower Indigenous communities through education opportunities. The problem, of course, was that education is controlled by the states. And so they only could do so much in regard to waving money at the states to do things. During the Menzies government's tenure, the, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, IATSIS, was established in 1964. IATSIS is a significant institution dedicated to Indigenous research, preservation of cultural materials and promoting understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, histories, cultures and societies. The creation of IATSIS demonstrated the government's recognition of the importance of Indigenous knowledge and culture, as well as a commitment to advancing understanding and respect for Indigenous Australians. This was coupled with the Menzies government establishment of handicraft centres in various locations to encourage Indigenous art and craftsmanship. These centres uh, sought to develop economic in, uh, opportunities for Indigenous people and promote their cultural heritage. Overall, it is obvious that the view of the Menzies administration was to preserve and teach Aboriginal culture. Again, another problem in that was that this, that was done in the territories and it wasn't really carried on within the states because, again, they were in charge of education. In conclusion, the, Men the Menzies approach to Indigenous policy during its tenure from 1949 to 1966 was marked by a mix of progressive initi uh, initiatives and limitations. The government made significant strides in granting citizenship and voting rights to Indigenous Australians, acknowledging their equal status as citizens. Additionally, the introduction of land trust in the Northern Territory represented an essential step towards acknowledging Indigenous land rights, cultural preservation and self-determination. The establishment of the Council for in Aboriginal Affairs in 1951 demonstrated a commitment to addressing Indigenous issues systematically, coordinating policy and welfare initiatives. However, the Council's limitations, such as the lack of Indigenous representation and, lit and limited legal powers, impacted it its effect effectiveness in driving significant policy changes. Efforts to improve Indigenous welfare and education included funding for housing, health, home, uh, health care, education services, as investments in vocational programs. While these initiatives dis demonstrated recognition of the need to address socio-economic disparity, challenges persist persistent resulting in ad inadequate services and disparities compared to non-Indigenous communities. The creation of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, IATSIS, and handicraft centres in various locations further uh, uh, showed the example of the government commitment to understanding and preserving Indigenous cultures and history. Despite the, the, the Menzies government positive uh, initiatives, it is critical to acknowledge the historical context and involving attitudes towards Indigenous affairs during that period. Some policies, that the, uh, uh, such as the assimilationist approach, have faced criticism for potentially perpetrating notions of white supremacy and disregarding the preservation of Indigenous cultures. Subsequent governments would build upon the foundations laid by the Menzies administration, developing more comprehensive policies aimed at achieving better outcomes for Indigenous Australians. Ini initiatives in Indigenous rights and reconciliation has continued to involve, evolve, emphasising self-determination, cultural uh, preservation and addressing historical injustice. The Menzies government's policies and initiatives towards Indigenous Australians marked an important milestone in, in recognising uh, Indigenous people, recognising citizenship, recognising land rights and promoting educational and vocational training and fostering the understanding and preservation of Indigenous cultures. While limitations and, and challenges remain, these, these efforts contributed to the ongoing journey towards reconciliation, equality and empowerment for Indigenous Australians in the years to come. <laughs>
The le legacy of the Menzies government contributed to Indigenous policy, policy highlights the importance of acknowledging historical developments while continuing to work to a more equitable and inclusive future for all Australians. In 1963, seven people in the Federal Council for the Aboriginal Advance Advancement, which became known as the CATSI delegation, met with Sir, Sir Robert Menzies. It was the first time that an Aboriginal Prime Minister had received a deputation of Aboriginal people. They included Sir Doug Nichols from Victoria, Kath Walker and Joe McGuinness from Queensland, Faith Bandler from New South Wales, Philip Roberts from Darwin, Ted Penny from Western Australia and Malcolm Cooper from South Australia. The major issue they raised was to seek a referendum on the two sections of the Australian Constitution which discriminated against Aboriginal people, section 51 and section 127. Menzies is on the record in 1965 arguing passionately about changing section 51 as it was it was a safeguard against, against discriminating uh, Commonwealth legislation di directed against Aboriginal people. And the phrase was removed. It could be set up a, as a separate body of industry, social, criminal and other laws relating exclusively to Aborigines. So Menzies was a reforming government and it was a government that really took on the battle of the period of improving the lives of Indigenous Australians across the board. And from that, it, it has reached past them. Harold Holt completed the 1967 referendum. Gorton uh, set up AB studies, which was to get Aboriginal kids to school and people to universities. You had Malcolm Fraser in 1976 doing land rights and that continues on and on and on today. So they were, these, they were two remarkable men, um, uh, Sir Robert Menzies and Sir Paul Hasluck. They were men before their time. Thank you.